This isn't a very popular opinion in the Fates community, but I think Hayato is one of the best targets for investment in Birthright. Birthright is a game that lets bulky mages really shine, especially late in the game. Their access to tomes, arguably the best weapon type in the game, in combination with some of the best enemy phase classes, lets bulky mages single-handedly make quick work of enemy formations that would normally take a swarm of units to kill. So why don't people think he's worth using? The biggest problem with Hayato is the long process of getting him to the point where he's killing everything. He needs to be fed a lot of experience to catch up with the rest of the army and stats, and instead of deploying Hayato, a lot of players will just focus their experience into units that are further ahead. They do this before realizing that Hayato really doesn't take that much investment to sustain himself. If you keep training him, he'll become an incredibly useful unit. That's why we're here in Paralogue 1, the chapter designed to get Mozu caught up with the rest of the army. Feeding Hayato most of the kills in this chapter is more than enough to get him to start snowballing. Most players don't even give him the opportunity to level up in this chapter though, since they completed before Hayato even joins. I don't think that's the best course of action, for a few reasons. First off, this map is very useful for raising support points between units, but units can only gain support points if they exist in your army. We recruited Satsuna and Azama during Chapter 8, so they wouldn't have been able to be here if we did the chapter as soon as we were able to. Completing Chapter 8 also provides us with a Dragon Vein point to build the Mess Hall or the Smithy. Since every enemy on this map besides the boss is identical, getting the exact damage you need with Meals and Forges can really help with setting up kills. And Chapter 8 doesn't have enough deployment slots for your entire army plus Mozu. At least one unit would have to sit out that chapter if you did Paralog 1 before it. With Mozu being arguably the worst performing unit in that chapter, I don't think this is a huge loss. With that out of the way, let's get started. We start by having Tsubaki move in range of 3 faceless. Silas baits 2 more to the south. and Hayato immediately uses a heart seal to get into Oni Savage. He loses the ability to attack from 2 range, but he gains a lot from this class change. He initially had the same bulk as base Mozu, meaning he would die in one hit to any faceless. But being in the Oni Savage class changes this. He gets an incredible plus 6 defense and plus 3 HP. This, coupled with the defense tonic, allows him to survive any 2 hits from a faceless at full health. He also gets up to 7 strength and access to the 5 might brass club. This lets him deal damage to faceless at base, which is a lot more than you can say about Mozu. Azama heals him for 1 experience, which is more than the 0 experience you would've gotten if Hayato hadn't class changed. That's what you call optimization. All the faceless in this map have zero luck. This means they're particularly vulnerable to getting crit by units with high skill, like Tsubaki. Any kill that Tsubaki gets from a crit is a kill that we won't be able to feed to a trainee. To minimize our chance of getting these unlucky crits, we gave him the Brass Naginata. It can't land crits at all. Each one of these faceless does a pretty big chunk of damage to him. If he takes damage from all three, he would die. But since he doubles each of them while being paired up with his future wife Setsuna, his guard gauge will let him block every other attack after it activates for the first time. The same is true for Silas, who's doing enough damage to set up kills in just one round of combat. Hayato being an Oni Savage does wonders for his long-term viability as a mage. It barely lowers his magic growth while boosting his defense growth by a massive 20%. This makes it a lot easier for him to reach the point where he's effectively invincible. He'll be getting back his access to magical weapons with the Bolt Axe in Chapter 14. Hayato taking out these faces on player phase means he won't be taking damage, freeing up actions he would otherwise spend healing. Korin transfers his Zama away so he can heal Silas. We're going to be using him to chip more faceless.
we made sure to tune Tsubaki's damage so that he leaves the faceless at 1 health after 2 rounds of combat. This makes it even easier to feed kills to Hayato. With tonics, meals, weapon choices, and forges, getting exact damage numbers for things like this is almost always doable in Fates. On my honor as a knight. Tsubaki is dangerously low after that last turn. We're giving him a moment to heal up. Azura lets him go even further this turn. Kaze and Silas will be approaching the bottom group from a different angle. Corrin stands next to him to boost his hit rates during enemy phase. Hayato's hit rates aren't the best. Even after luck and skill tonics and having Korn next to him, his hit rate is still just 89%. His accuracy will never be the best, but the incredible combat stats he'll eventually have access to in Oni Shift in will make you want to use him often. He's probably the best user of the Goddess Icon and Secret Book to boost his hit rates. will be making a bit of a conservative play with Hayato, just spending his time healing up to take on two more faceless. He's staying next to Azura for the slight boost in hit rates. The rest of my moves this turn won't be that conservative. Units having one space between them lets us transfer and pair up on the same turn. Kaze gets back together with Silas. Tsubaki lets Korn recruit Mozu and smuggle her some tonics. This strength tonic lets Mozu deal 1 damage to faceless if they aren't on terrain. Satuna gets Tsubaki in position to heal for enemy phase. And Silas rides forward in preparation for next turn. Tsubaki's 100% hit rates are really nice compared to what Hayato and Mozu have. We'll start this turn by having Tsubaki finish setting up the skill for Mozu. We foolishly have Mozu attack from above and face a chance of death. She could have easily attacked from a force and gotten its plus one defense terrain bonus. With Mozu safe, Korn can spend her turn getting into position for our next moving trick.
Hayato's group pushes forward, with Hazami healing Hayato along the way. Since enemies prefer to move the fewest spaces possible if all other factors are equal, no faceless will ever attack him for the right. There is no RNG in this move. Silas can take on three faces on enemy phase, but if he's in range of four, he'll get surrounded and won't be able to escape. Silas runs away to avoid taking any kills. Mozu takes Kaze to protect against dual strikes. She is only in range of one piece of this turn. Being on a wood tile gives her a point of defense, which lets her survive a single hit. Tsubaki weakens up a straggler over here. We want Azama to heal Silas, and we want Hayato to get some kills during enemy phase. This maneuver lets us do both of those things. Only being able to take one hit instead of two really limits how aggressively you can position Mozu. When a unit doesn't double their opponent, assuming only enemy phase combat, the guard gauge activates every three rounds of combat. Unless he starts with his guard gauge completely empty, Hayato can take on three enemies each enemy phase. He can even go up to four without facing a chance of death if his guard gauge lands up properly. Mozu is only guaranteed to survive if she's in range of one enemy. She can only go up to two if the guard gauge lands up properly. You notice that faceless go around the river tiles? If it took a more direct path to where we are, it would have messed with our positioning this turn. To my knowledge, it's just RNG. I haven't found a consistent way to route it out. The Steel Shuriken debuff combined with Stylus' pair up bonus lets Mozu deal enough damage to get this kill. Silas not having Kaze as his backpack prevents him from doubling. This means he can attack the spaceless without stealing a kill. Hayato steps back to take care of the struggler. Thank you. 
Kaze sets up another kill for Mozu. It seems like she faces a chance of death, but if she missed, the guard gauge would have saved her. Since she landed that last hit, she still has a full guard gauge to protect her if she misses here. This kill gets Haizo hits 4th level. Since Moza's still behind, we'll be focusing the rest of the experience in this clear to her. This positioning lets us transfer Kaze away and get some experience on Azama. Mozu switches to Silas so that Azura can send him forward with Kaze. As we watch this play out, let's talk about the unit that Hayato is trying to build support points with. Azama. Azama is a monk with incredible stats, particularly in strength and bulk. He can't reap the full benefits of them due to his unfortunate class line though. He's locked to using staves in monk, and if you're willing to invest the only heart seal in the game before chapter 13 to make him into an apothecary, he's still locked to bows which can only attack at 2 range. This means he won't be able to use his exceptional bulk to kill hordes of enemies on enemy phase. It's a really unfortunate situation that leads a lot of players to promote him early to get access to lances. Okay? Even with the severe experience gain penalty he suffers from being promoted, his incredible stats will keep him relevant for the entire game, even with fewer opportunities to level up. We'll be taking a different approach to raising Azama though. There is another way to get Azama out of his bad class set before promotion, and that's through supports. Classes can be gained through friendship seals and partner seals if the unit is able to reach an A plus or S rank support. A plus supports have the advantage of being obtainable in fewer maps, and the earlier Azama escapes from being staff locked, the better. The options he has available right now are Hayato and Tsubaki. Azama does a bit better in the Skynet line than he does in the Diviner line, especially if you want him to end up in Mechanist after he's promoted, but I personally find that getting him support points with Hayato is more convenient. You might want to get Hayato to A plus with Azama to get the great masterclass for renewal anyways, so why not do it early? Mozu transfers Kaze from Silas to get his guard gauge charges. This lets her survive a second hit on enemy phase. As we clean up here, let's talk a bit about Mozu and why you might want to raise her. She starts at level 1 with abysmal base stats. Her growth rates are pretty good thanks to aptitude, but over the course of a playthrough, she won't have too much of an edge over other units until really late in the game. And if you want to get there, you'll have to drag along a level 1 unit in one of the worst classes in the game who's locked to brass Naginatas until she sees 20 combats. She can barely even take a hit for most relevant enemies until she catches up in levels. Unlike Hayato, her heart seal class doesn't save her in the context of birthright. 
While her access to the Archer class can do wonders for revivability and conquest, where having a good player phase is a major factor in determining how good a unit is, in birthrights, where good units can walk into a huge swarm of enemies and take them out all at once, only being able to take on one enemy at a time doesn't make her stand out. To add insult to injury, her base class set doesn't give her access to shurikens, the only physical weapons that can double at 1-2 range. She wants to be in the Mechanist class, but to get there, she has to stay tethered to Kaze or Saizo. They don't benefit much from the skill and luck pair bonuses she gives in Villager. Still, if you put all that aside, a trained Muzu will have good stats. If you decide to use her, she'll turn out fine. It just takes a lot more effort for Mozu to get to the point where she's killing everything and not dying, especially when you compare her to, say, Obero. But she'll get there with enough favoritism. Still, she's not going to pull very far ahead of the many great candidates for bulky carries by very much, so keep that in mind. With that boss killed, we've raised both Muzu and Hayato to level 5, giving them a few opportunities to grow beyond their terrible base stats. At this point, they're still not completely caught up with the rest of the army, but it will be a lot easier to get them to speed from this point. Next time, I'll be showing off how to do just that in Chapter 9. If you liked the video and want to see more like this, be sure to subscribe.